Hey, Ernie, I am so excited. Tonight's Ernie's Corner because Quincy Jones, just a, a guy, I mean, respected not only in the world of jazz, but in the world of pop. Grammy winner, Grammy legend, and Quincy was very instrumental in launching the career of Leslie Gore when he was at Mercury Records. Yeah. And I know you have an interesting album cover back there. I guess he yeah. two handsome fellows, you and Quincy. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's funny. Uh, I never really, I mean, I, I always appreciated jazz and stuff, but I never really, and I may have heard his name here and there, you know, but it wasn't until 1971 when I was working in Manhattan. I worked at the company that I did the Rolling Stones tongue and you know, schools out and a whole bunch of big bamboo. And uh, that company had an ally at A&M Records, a guy named Gil Friesen, who was running the label. OK, and uh, he gave us uh, a sma uh, an, a Quincy Jones album to do. And I was up in the art department. This was after I you know, had already done the Stone Sung and had been hired by the company. So I'm up there designing packages made out of board instead of paper wrap. And because uh, that was my main job. My main job was to uh, create album graphics and covers that could only be printed on board because there was more of a profit in those days. And we had talked about this in the past, but it all links together. All these stories kind of are similar in the sense that the production of a paper package, a, a chipboard sleeve with two pieces of paper laminated to it was about five or six cents, depending on the group uh, to do that same board package would be about 18 to 20 cents. So, you know, maybe sometimes depending on the um, size of the group, it could be as little as, you know, 12 cents, but it could be as high as, you know, some of those album covers we did were a quarter, you know, so that was more than record companies were ever used to spending. But, you know, the artists had creative control and the industry was moving that way. And, uh, you know, the guy that we worked for was a real big, you know, advocate of that because he could buy it from the, the produce the uh, printer and sell it to the record company. So I got, I'm up in the art department and they uh, come up with a transparency of what you see Quincy there. Um, and uh, it was just a shot of him with that background. And it was really pretty boring. You know, it just really, and again, I didn't really know who he was and all that he had done. I mean, you talk about Grammy. I don't think anybody's ever been nominated as many times as that guy has and won a lot, you know, but, but that the music is just one part of it. You know, and, and so I get this transparency and I, I did some lettering for it. You know, it's nothing fancy uh, that you see over there in the upper corner over there. Um, and um, I was looking at this picture and I thought it really needed something. And we needed to make a board package out of it. Okay, so what do I have to do to that photograph to make it warrant a board package? Well, you know, I had a, a, a friend in uh, Oakland who was a, a landscape photographer and did a lot of, you know, forest shots and stuff. And he had sent me some transparencies, you know, and I had a few friends that did it. Painters would send me pictures of their stuff to see if I could put them on album covers. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking through his stuff and I see this shot of the tree and this landscape. And I really liked it, but it was a color shot and I didn't really like the color of it. So I changed it to this duotone with green and yellow or blue and yellow, basically. And I silhouetted Quincy and put it in his uh, body. And then if you, you can't see it here, but if you had the actual album, you could see that his um, that whole area with the tree and stuff is debossed and embossed. So there's all this texture to it and levels of embossing okay that would bring things forward and backward minuscule but still a tactile feel to it to where it couldn't be printed on paper okay there's no way that you can align the paper with the embossing when it's a loose sheet that's got tolerances that aren't as tight as printing directly on a board so that's how we, i did that album and it came out and smackwater jack was a pretty big album you know for him and it, it was one of the early i guess moving more away from just um you know just doing jazz stuff this was sort of kind of getting him more into you know that mainstream of music uh, that everything, you know, was going on. This is 1971. So, you know, that I did that in New York. And then I came out for that same company to L.A. to open up an office. 
uh, and we talked about this before we started, we left the company we were working for, his vice president and I, and his head of production, and we started Pacific Iron Ear in January of 1972. Well, um, no sooner than we were there, uh, and we started, um, you know, gathering up work, uh, we got a project, we got a call actually from uh, Joe Friesen, who was running the label, and he had us come in, and we um, met with Quincy Jones. And it was in Gil's office, it was, you know, kind of, um, surrealistic you know because by now then i'm understanding who he is and doing a little research after the fact of course but it turned out that he really liked that smackwater jack cover and he needed a logo so he hired us to do and he i guess he liked my lettering you know from stuff that i had done since i did smackwater jack and i did that quincy jones lettering that you see up there along the top and he still uses that to this day I mean, he really, really liked it. In that same time, um, he was he he was getting involved with um, this guy named Lester Wilson, and they it was a Lester was writing a musical with dancers and and songs and all that stuff. It was a stage play called Six Hundred Dollars in a Mule, and what it was was a sort of a representation of how black people after they uh, got freed from slavery were given $600 a mule and an acre of land. And that was kind of their reciprocation of, you know, coming away from slavery. And so Lester wrote this and produced this, uh, this musical and Quincy got involved with him and he, you know, they needed a logo. So what you see over there in that, is is a, a beautiful woman in this art deco kind of circular thing. Drew Struzan did the illustration. And then I did the lettering at six hundred dollars in a mule. And actually we got a chance to meet Lester. We went to a rehearsal uh out here in LA and they were rehearsing, you know, the, the, the thing and and uh Quincy was there. And, you know, we were, we, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time with him, but we got a chance to sort of see what it was. And, and that's when we came away and did that logo because he wanted us to get a feel of, you know, what this thing was about, you know, and, and, and the feel of it. So that's why he had this come to this rehearsal and it worked out really well. I mean, it's a beautiful logo. And again, I'll send you these, these images so that you can blow them up so our neighbors can sort of see how they really look it, it's hard when they're real small like that and i'm trying to get stuff in there and fit it in that format but you know it's it's funny because i and and that was really kind of the last thing we did for him and then you know you, you keep on working and stuff and you know i i the next awareness that i i had of quincy jones was when he got involved with michael jackson you know and thriller 1982 was I, I think, you know, not only was it a, a real booster for Michael Jackson and his career, because you know, I don't think his solo career was doing as big as it was until Quincy got involved and Thriller came out. And his, he, he, he was like a booster rocket. You know, he was doing this and then he went like that. You know, and I think that with the same thing happened for Quincy. You know, it really sort of introduced him to a younger hip hop, uh, you know, uh, audience that he was never really a big part of. Not really, not like with Michael Jackson. I mean, yeah, Jackson was already big, but he never was as big as he was when he got involved with, with uh, Quincy Jones. And, and, you know, and then, you know, a couple of years later, you know, you had, we are the people Quincy did that. You know, put all those musicians together. I mean, it was an amazing thing, you know. And, and, you know, and I found out, and this is something I didn't know, and this is the honest God truth. The other night I was watching see, Turner Movie Classics, and it had on In Cold Blood with Robert Blake. And that movie was crazy. Truman Capote had a nervous breakdown. Uh, nobody would hire Michael uh, 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 no one would hire Robert Blake for years later. I mean, he was a little rascal. He was already kind of an institution in the movie business. Once he did In Cold Blood, they could, he, he, Beretta was the next thing he did. Yeah. You know, uh, and so, um, you know, I was watching that movie 
And at the end, I'm watching the titles, music created by Quincy Jones. And I'm like, you got to be kidding. You know, and we're, and, you know, we're doing this. I knew we were going to be doing this. And it's like, I can't believe that he did that. I mean, and I, I really liked the movie. In fact, in Cold Blood, my girlfriend in junior high school was uh, neighbors to the guy that played Robert Blake's partner in the movie. He went on, he still does, he's an old guy now, but his partner in that movie was my girlfriend's next door neighbor. And I remember one summer him coming back from LA. He had gone off, he went, graduated, went off to Hollywood. Okay, he came back and we were sitting in her mom's kitchen and he was there telling us about how he just got this huge opportunity with Truman, to work with Truman Capote on this movie called In Cold Blood. You know, and, and, you know, he got that part. I mean, it was, and it was just so connected to make me remember all that stuff, you know, and, and the, the achievements. I mean, he went on and he did the Fresh Prince, Fresh Prince of Bel Air. You know, I mean, he's done some incredible stuff. Uh, and the color purple with Whoopi Goldberg, or not Whoopi Goldberg, uh, what's her name? Uh, Oprah Winfrey. Whoopi, Oprah Winfrey, Whoopi, yeah. Whoopi was in it, though. Whoopi oh, was that's right. It. She was. Yeah, yeah she, she was. was yeah, it, yes. but I was trying to think of Oprah Winfrey, right, because that really launched her career. Um, and so, you know, it's it's really uh, funny how, you know, even though we, you know, we never really did a whole lot more for him, just being part of it, you know, doing what I did. I mean, it's like when we talked about Melanie. I didn't do six albums for her or ten albums for her. I did three. You know, Quincy Jones, I did three projects. I'm honored to be able to have done something that he still uses. I'm honored that he, you know, he did, he liked what we did so much. He called us back to do two more things. I mean, that's really, you know, that's kind of an amazing thing for me, you know, to be able to say, yeah, I did this. And most people have no idea that, you know, that I would do work for Quincy Jones you know, uh, the same guy that did Black Sabbath and Welcome My Nightmare and all these other things and, and the Partridge family and the Brady Bunch, you know. And <laughs> well, Ernie, we are enlightening them. Yeah, we are. We are Thanks to you. Thanks to you. All. Thank you, too. You know, mm. and that is a real compliment from Quincy because Quincy, you know, he had, he had an eye for talent in performers, but obviously he had, a, he had an eye for great designers and great artists. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be able to have been part of, again, uh, the Rolling Stones thing we're going to be talking about next week with Licks and, and, and that whole thing that's coming out now in Goldmine Magazine, as we talked about, it's just presenting the facts. And it's not one-sided. It's multifactional. You know, there's different perspectives. Everybody knows that there's two sides to every story. You know, and this presents the different sides, this story. And I think that the stones really love it. I think they love the fact that there's controversy because it keeps them on top of mind with fans. Yes. You know, I've gone to a couple of Rolling Stones blogs, serious, heavy core. You know, they're like the Alice Cooper fans that dress up like Al Alice with the eye makeup and the, the whole thing with a snake around them and go to the concert. You know, those kind of heavy, dedicated fans. And, you know, they, they get pretty, you know, they get, at, they, they get upset at each other and stuff if they don't all can't agree. And I think the Stones like that. I think they like the controversy. You know, it's the same reason they never use the same person twice, you know, uh, for, for stuff. You know, they, uh, they, they're always looking for the new. They're looking for the fresh, you know. And I think Quincy Jones had that same kind of quality, ability of looking for things that weren't always, I, I think he was really happy to break out of the jazz thing, never losing one foot in it, but, yes. you know, getting into pop, getting into movies, getting into television, getting into all these things, you know, I mean, it, it was a pretty incredible man, you know, and again, I'm very honored to just have been one little piece, you know, a grain of sand on the beach, so to speak. <laughs> but grains of sand are very important. Yeah. They are. It makes up the beach. Without it the, sure without the does. Sand, you'd have dirt. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and, and judging from Quincy's career, he saw that a lot of people. I respect both him and Michael Jackson because they yeah. both decided to work with, with each other and they allowed each other to uh, make a contribution. And that, yeah. that showed, you know, in, in the careers of both of them. 
Yeah, and that doesn't happen a lot. You know, I, I, I know of a few, you know, Bob Ezrin, obviously, with Alice. You know, they're willing to, because uh, most of them go, well, look, you know, we're the stars here. You know, you're just sort of recording what we create. So we know what's best for us, you know, and they have that conflict, you know, yes. producer, a manager, your record company, you know, I mean, it's, it's so, it's so relevant in that industry and to find somebody like a Michael Jackson is, is, is as huge as he was, you know, to listen to Quincy Jones and Quincy Jones is big as he is to listen to Michael Jackson. Just like you said, it's, it's a rare combination. And when you get that combination, you move good to great. Good to great. That's what yes. I've always tried to do. I try to do things that are timeless. So if I can show you some of these logos, okay, that logo was done 30 years ago. Oh, it wow. Looks like it, could, it looks like it could have been done yesterday. I cannot More believe than it's 30. Been done. Well, it was in the 80s, so it was yeah. about 40 years ago. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> believe that. Yeah. Well, and I, and I, and I can show you, uh, if you look at a lot of the stuff that I've done, you know, I mean, Stone Stone, Alice Cooper's logo, all the, the Bee Gees, I mean, those things look like they, they could have been done yesterday. I don't, I'm not a, a fad follower, okay? There are a lot of fad followers. I'm not a fad follower, you know, because fad followers end up being history, okay? And I don't want to become history right away. I'm, 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 I want to be history, but I don't want to be history now. Only after I'm gone, I want to be history. 